In this video, I'm going to be covering some different animalic raw materials in perfumery. So what are animalic raw materials? Well, those are raw materials that are either derived from animalic or they smell quite animalic in the way they smell, so they can also be categorized as animalic. Now, there are some raw materials which I'm not going to cover in this video. So, for example, one category of those is musks, which is probably the biggest category of animalic raw materials. In fact, this category is so important that I've already gone and done a whole separate video on it. So if you want to learn about musks, then go and check out that video. Now, I'm also going to do another video on leathery raw materials in the future. So there's something called castorium, which probably should be in a video on animalic raw materials, but I'm also not going to cover that here. Um, you'll just have to wait for that one. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see that video, and I'll try to prioritize it out of the next videos I do. Anyway, so in this video, I'm going to talk about five specific animalic raw materials. So the first raw material is something called civet. Now, this actually comes from a really cute little cat. And the way they used to obtain this raw material was they went and actually scraped um, this secretion off of the glands of the cat. Now, I know that's pretty grim. Yeah, perfumery used to be kind of grim. That's just how it is. Anyway, um, they would use that and put it in perfumes for this kind of animalic effect. Nowadays, thankfully, they don't do that anymore. It's actually now illegal. And what they do instead, which is far more ethical and sustainable, is uh, the big fragrance companies who've got their labs, who've gone and analyzed, you know, the different molecules inside of things, they've actually gone and reconstituted their own uh, synthetic version of civet, which is what I've got right here. And this is still quite widely today used in different perfumes. So what does it smell like? Well, to be honest, it smells pretty disgusting. It's probably the closest raw material, I would say, in terms of smell to poo. So yeah, you can kind of get an idea for how it smells. And apparently it contains something called civetone, which is meant to be the unique thing that gives its unique smell. But also interestingly, it contains exaltolide, which is a common musk used in perfumery, which actually does smell quite nice, unlike, you know, the rest of it. So maybe that's one reason that it used to be used because it kind of, you know, maybe on the face of it, it smells bad, but it does have some kind of like nice uh, elements or something inside of it. I don't know. Now I'm saying it smells bad and that is more to the untrained nose. If you were to talk to a perfumer, what they would tell you in a more professional way is that perfumers don't have, you know, good or bad smells. They're just smells and they learn to use them in different contexts. Now, perfumers do use this stuff, and one of the reasons they do use it sometimes is when they want to make a perfume a bit darker or a bit more dirty. This can especially be the case if you've got a, a perfume, say, with loads of kind of uh, very delicate florals, and you know, you want it to be uh, more, <laughs> it sounds weird to say this, but like seductive or stuff like that, um, or maybe you just want it to have a darker side, then one, some people's solution is to go and put some civet in it, albeit at a very trace amount, just a tiny amount. The idea is not really you're meant to smell it. It's not meant to come through as this kind of poo smell in the perfume. It's just kind of meant to have this underlying, um, this underlying kind of thing to it, uh, make of it what you will. Now, a good non-weird use that I actually found for it uh, was when I was doing the last video on chocolate accords. If you go and read Jean-Claude Elena's book, he actually says that if you want to make a chocolate ganache accord, then adding a touch of civet to your chocolate accord can go and help with that. And I tried that and it seemed to work just fine. But yeah, after giving this raw material a chance, when you start to think of other things like chocolate and when you remember in your mind that it is actually fully synthetic, um, it does actually have this quite dark but warm aspect or warm smell to it and when you smell it in the context of the chocolate accord you do kind of see how it can um, impart these effects to a blend to give you what you want that's not necessarily just a a shitty smell to be honest okay so next we have something called indole now this one is probably one of the uh, very classic raw materials that's used in perfumery. If you're a perfumer, you should really have some of this or at least know what it smells like. And it's very important. And basically that is for two reasons. And those two reasons are jasmine and orange blossom. I think about jasmine and orange blossom is these are two of the most loved raw materials in perfumery and they have been for hundreds of years. The downside is, however, they've always been very expensive and that's because people have had to collect all of the petals off of the jasmine or the orange blossom and then 
gather a massive amount of them by hand and then only to go and make the absolute where you just get a tiny amount out at the end of it so it's very labor intensive um, and very expensive. Because of that for the longest of times perfumers have been trying to make their own synthetic accords for things like jasmine and orange blossom. Not necessarily fully synthetic, sometimes they can use some naturals as well, um, but the idea is a cheap reproducible accord that smells pretty much like jasmine or pretty much like orange blossom and what they found was, as part of those accords, indole is really important. And in fact, indole is actually found in those raw materials, which is why it's so important. And you'll actually find that it's one of the things that's very important for their distinctive characteristic. I.e., If you miss out the indole, then it's going to be very difficult to get an accurate orange blossom accord. Also, when you go and smell jasmine or you go and smell orange blossom, after actually having smelled indole, it, you just cannot miss it in the smell. Um, suddenly, you just smell indole. Anyway, I've got some here, so what does it smell like? Now, this stuff is very strong. <laughs> and honestly, it, like I said, is one of those things that is so important in perfumery that as a perfumer, you really should know what this smells like. It's almost like a base smell. It's very hard to describe it using other smells. But if I had to put a description on it, I would say it lies somewhere between fart gas or almost a civity kind of smell and petrol. So it's, yeah, that kind of thing. You know, it's very, it's very aggressive. Um, it's very, um, I don't know, it's weird. It just fills up your nose and it gives you a, a funny smell. Uh, basically, go and smell it. Next then, I have something called Beeswax Absolute. And unlike the previous two, this one actually smells pretty nice. So this one is obtained from bees. So when bees go and make honey, they also make beeswax as a byproduct, and this can be collected uh, by the people who make the honey. And if you go and take that beeswax, you can go and make an absolute from it, which is just a method of extraction of perfumery raw materials. Now this stuff is not so widely used, but out of anything on this list, it's probably technically genuinely the most animalic raw material on the list. And that's because uh, something like the civet nowadays, even though it used to be a major animalic raw material, is now technically synthetic. I mean, it's, they still count as animalic, right? Indole is more animalic because it smells animalic, right? It smells kind of dirty and a bit civety, that kind of thing. Um, but it doesn't actually really have much to do with animals particularly. This beeswax is actually, well, extracted out of the wax, which is made by bees. So there you go. Anyway, it smells like, well, surprise, surprise, it smells like beeswax. Um, so if you like the smell of beeswax, like I do, I mean, for me, it brings back a lot of good memories as a kid, you know, uh, visiting bees and making little beeswax candles, that kind of thing, then you'll probably like this. I feel like it's quite a rustic kind of countryside smell. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously everyone's going to have their own associations. Anyway, it smells like beeswax, smells a little bit like honey as well. One thing I found is when using this in perfumes, it's actually very subtle. So it's very hard to get this as a prominent note. And I have also read that apparently it's more often used as a modifier for things. It can be used in, you know, honey like fragrances, sometimes tobacco notes, that kind of thing, which, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, but it's probably going to be difficult to get this to be a key prominent note unless you have a very minimalistic fragrance and add a lot of beeswax. And it's also quite yellowy, which you might be able to see here which means it will stain, say you have like a white t-shirt as well if you're gonna use a lot of it. But anyway, beeswax absolute, I like it a lot. Another thing which I think is actually quite interesting about it is the smell of the beeswax absolute. Apparently it can vary quite a lot depending on uh, things like, well, the terroir, as they would say in French, which is kind of like the environment that it's grown in. So things like the species of plant which the bees uh, went to collect all of their pollen from and then the actual environment itself. So things, you know, like the temperature and all of those can go and contribute to, uh, in the same way that honey smells different depending on the region and the bees and things like that. Well, similarly, the beeswax absolute can also have different smells. So if you were a beeswax absolute connoisseur, which I don't believe there are many of, then I'm sure you could have a lot of fun uh, finding the different beeswax absolutes. And quickly before we move on, a shameless little plug for my brand, my own perfume called Moonlight Harvest actually contains beeswax absolute as one of the key notes. And in this perfume, I've blended it with other things like lavender and uh, wheat, the smell of wheat. So you get this nice kind of rustic countryside effect. You've also got fruity notes like cherry and apple. So it's this, it's supposed to be a nice kind of harvest time, autumn fragrance. So if you like beeswax absolute and you're interested in that kind of thing, 
uh, and check out my fragrance. Anyway, back to what you're here for, the actual content. So the next one I'm gonna talk about is Amberome Absolute. Now this one is a speciality raw material created by a company called Cinerome. It's a big French uh, fragrance raw materials producer, which is quite well renowned. Now this Amberome, what it really is, is they've taken a regular kind of labdanum raw material and they've gone and made its ethyl esters. So they've gone and done a chemical reaction on it in a similar way to how vetiver acetate is made from vetiver oil. And then from that, um, a lot of the molecules have you know, been transformed inside of the natural, leaving you with a whole new raw material. So you could kind of say this is halfway between a natural and a synthetic. Again, this one doesn't really relate to animals. It just kind of smells animalic and that's why it's in the animalic category. When you smell it, to me, at least it reminds me of labdanum, but it's a lot more animalic than labdanum. I think it's got these kind of, let's say leathery tones to it. Also maybe slight plasticky tones. Um, it's a lot less your kind of sweet um, thing like labdanum, which blends nicely into kind of, let's say a more gourmand style amber cord. This is a lot more rough around the edges. It's a lot darker. And depending on the context, what you're trying to do with your perfume, this may or may not be more or less appropriate. The final raw material that I've got here is something called Ambronol. Specifically, I've got Ambronol 95 made by IFF, uh, but there are different types of Ambronol. Uh, for example, the regular one I think is made by Feminich, but essentially it's just a synthetic molecule. Now this molecule, Ambronol, is actually found naturally inside of ambergris. If you don't know what ambergris is, it's essentially the vomit of a sperm whale. Now, if you want to understand a bit more about that, um, you can go and watch my video on ambroxan. Ambroxan is another molecule alongside ambronol. They're both found together in this whale vomit. But essentially this ambergris stuff, which ends up washing up on beaches, uh, this has been for a long time tinctured by perfumers, i.e. kind of extracted and put in perfumes. This especially was before all of these molecules had been discovered and they were trying to find things which would, uh, the best way to say it would be to kind of exalt or boost their perfumes. This is the stuff they ended up using. Now, of course, um, this stuff doesn't wash up on the beach that much. So on one hand, it's expensive. And also, I just think that most people wouldn't like to know that their perfume comes from whale vomit. But luckily now, scientists in labs have synthesized these two molecules and you can go and get them as synthetics to put them in your perfumes. It's actually quite useful for perfumers because in the natural thing, they're found at very low amounts. Whereas when they're made synthetically, they're made pure, which means that you only need a tiny amount to add to your perfume instead of adding a load of ambergris tincture. So to me, this reminds me of cashmeran, which is a kind of earthy, musky smelling aroma chemical. So it reminds me a little bit of that cashmere wool smell. It reminds me a bit of wet fur. It just generally, other than that, reminds me of this kind of dark, uh, slightly damp, musty smell. So on its own, it's not really, um, I wouldn't think most people would have thought of this as a nice smell. But then again, like most of these animalics, uh, it's often that you wanna use at least the potent ones, maybe the beeswax is different, but most of these you wanna use them in trace amounts for some kind of overall effect that they may have on the perfume, which you may not even notice. And a good example of this is, or at least when I learned how this could be used effectively was a few months back when I went and did my video making the Dreamer by Versace. So I found an online formula for this perfume called the Dreamer by Versace. And in that formula, they used some Ambronol. And it was just a tiny amount. And what I found by doing that study was, it seemed to add not this kind of dirty animalic smell to the perfume in the trace amount that it was, it actually added a, a kind of subtle warmth in the background and it contributed to an overall kind of sweet ambery, uh, let's say facet of the smell of the perfume. Now IFF themselves who sell this raw material, they say it uh, possesses the elegant tonalities of aged natural ambergris tincture. So anyway, I think it's one of those ones where 
Again, you probably want to end up using tiny amounts and experiment with the effects that those can have on your perfumes. And some perfumes are going to work more than others. Um, but I guess the take home is if you're working on especially a perfume where you want an ambery note, just because this doesn't smell like a sweet, lovely amber as it is, it doesn't mean that it won't help it get there by adding just a tiny amount of it. So anyway, those are my five animalic raw materials for this video. Like I said, if you're interested in other things like musks, then check out the musks video. If you're interested in ambroxan, check out the ambroxan video. I also talk about ambergris in there. And I'm also planning on doing a video on leathery raw materials where I'm going to cover castorium, which is something that you may have expected to be in this video, and some other leathery things. So if you're looking to make a leathery perfume, then keep your eyes open for that video. Now, if you don't want to miss that video when it comes out, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons on YouTube because obviously that will tell YouTube that you want to have my videos pop up onto your feed whenever I release them. Aside from that, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.